Welcome everybody um, to this inaugural session of the Zebra Inflation Drivers and Dynamics webinar. My name is Raphael Schönle and I'm one of the organizers of this webinar today on behalf of the central bank uh, research organization Zebra and Dominic Smith is my other co-organizer. Inflation is a pressing issue so without much ado let me pass on the virtual stage to Rob Rich, the director of the Center for Inflation Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland, who will be today's moderator. Rob? Thanks very much, Raphael. And um, good morning, afternoon, or evening from wherever you're joining us today. Uh, the topic of today's session is new insights from index methodology and co-organized by the Center for Inflation Research at the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. And my special thanks to the organizers, Raphael Schenle from Brandeis University in Zebra, and Dominic Smith from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics. Um, as far as the format for today, uh, just a reminder, uh, the webinar will be 45 minutes in length with a total of two presentations of approximately 15 minutes each, and then we'll have 10 to 15 minutes uh, remaining for, for question and answers at the end. Uh, attendees, um, you won't have the option to switch um, on your audio video, but are invited to write comments or questions in the Q&A space. I will then select questions to be answered in the QA portion of the webinar after the presentations. Also, just as a note, the webinar is also live streamed via the Zebra YouTube channel, recorded and made available on the Zebra website, www.zebra.org, and Zebra YouTube channel after the event. Um, um, important disclaimer for today, participant, participation in a Zebra webinar does not constitute or imply an endorsement recommendation or favoring endorsement of the views, op opinions, products, or services of the Central Bank Research Association or any other participating institution, individual, or entity. All views expressed during the CEBRA or CEBRA co-hosted event are strictly those of the authors, discussants, and other participants, and not those of CEBRA, the co-sponsoring institutions, or any other participating institution. So with that out of the way, let me just briefly mention today and today's speakers and introduce them. Um, our very first session will feature Laura Lorenstein, my colleague, uh, who is a research economist in the banking and finance group in the research department of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland. Her research focuses on residential and commercial real estate, and she'll be talking about the role of rent um, for inflation. And that will be followed by Christopher Weishart, economist at Donsmark National Bank, you will speak about heterogeneity and inflation indices. So with that, Laura, I will stop screen sharing and turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, Rob. Um, all right, so, so first of all, can people see my screen? No. Okay. All right, I think we're good to go now. All right, so thank you to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present this work. This paper is joint work with three co-authors, Brian Adams and Hugh Montag of the BLS and Randall Verbrugge of the Cleveland Fed. And this paper is called Disentangling Rent Index Differences, Data Methods and Scope. And as Rob mentioned, nothing I say today reflects the opinion of the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland or the Federal Reserve System. So the basis for this paper is the fact that we're seeing some of the highest inflation we've seen in decades, and the largest component of inflation is shelter. And a component of shelter inflation, as it's measured, is the rent paid by renters of renter-occupied housing units. And so as you can see from this plot where I plotted CPI tenant rent, CPI tenant rent is high relative to its historical average. And because it makes up such a large component of overall CPI inflation, we really want to understand what's like the underlying dynamics of this specific component. And an interesting fact about CPI tenant rent is that it diverges substantially from other sources, other publicly available sources of rent inflation. So for example, Zillow makes available a rent inflation measure, which is based off of rental listings on their website and rental listings from other sources that they collect and aggregate. And 
recently, at least since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic, this measure of rent inflation has diverged substantially from CPI tenant rent. Another measure that's often used is the CoreLogic Single Family Rent Index. And that also, while historically a sort of somewhat tracked CPI tenant rent, is currently diverges substantially and is specifically much, much higher than CPI tenant rent. And if we used, for example, the Zillow measure of rent inflation, C C total CPI inflation would actually be reading about three percentage points higher than it is currently reading. And so what we want to do in this paper is understand why these different measures of rent inflation differ so much. And so I've shown you two, and there are others available, all sort of called from different sources. But there's a variety of measure reasons why they would differ so much from, from CPI tenant rent. So one of those is that they're different data sources. So as I mentioned, Zillow and CoreLogic both pull their data from rental listings on the multiple listing service, which is a website that's effectively run by real estate agents. And so they will list properties for sale, but they'll also list properties for rent. And so those rental listings will appear on that website and CoreLogic or Zillow can aggregate those and pull in all that information to create um, a data set of rental rates on specific apartments. By contrast, the CPI tenant rent is created from a survey, a random survey that's very carefully designed and designed to be representative of the entire United States renter occupied housing um, stock. So that's one reason why they could be different. They could also be different due to different methodologies. So CPI tenant rent is effectively a weighted average rent growth for the properties in their sample that's underlying their C that underlies that series. Whereas both Zillow and CoreLogic and a few other sources use a repeat transaction index methodology. And then lastly, they can be different because of their of different scope. So the BLS housing survey, which is the data that underlies official CPI shelter inflation, is surveys all renter occupied housing units. And that includes whether or not the tenant is new and moved in recently or whether they've been staying there for years. By contrast, by nature of having of, of the source of the data being rental listings on a service such as MLS, Zillow and CoreLogic are using new tenant rents or effectively the rents of, of properties that are looking for a new tenant. So what are we gonna do in this paper? So we're gonna disentangle exactly what's driving these differences. So we're gonna use this housing survey that underlies the official CPI tenant rent to create um, indices that reflect the methodology used by these alternative sources. So we're gonna create repeat transaction rent indices that so that we match the methodology used by Zillow and CoreLogic to see if that explains the difference between CPI tenant rent and these alternative indices. And then we're going to furthermore limit our repeat transaction indices to all tenants versus new tenants. And that's going to allow us to differentiate whether these new, um, where, whether these alternative indices are being, the differences between those and CPI tenant rent are being driven by um, methodology or whether it's being driven by the fact that they have just completely different data sources or whether it's by the scope. So whether it includes just all tenants or new tenants. And what we're going to find is that pretty much all of the very all of the difference is explained by limiting the data set to new tenants versus all tenants. And then we're going to discuss a few more details, such as how much CPI tenant rent lags new tenant rent growth, which is about by four quarters or a year. And then we discuss some very briefly some implications for inflation measurement and monetary policy. So the BLS housing survey is very unique. There's very little out there that's like it. It surveys about 40,000 rental units every six months. It divides those into six month panels. So a specific unit is surveyed every six months and then um, the sample is sort of divided evenly across those six panels. Um, and then it's very carefully designed to be geographically representative. And so there's it uses a census to sort of create a uniform distribution, not uniform distribution, but like a representative distribution of where renters are located. And then it also includes a variety of information, including the unit characteristics, when the tenant has moved in, and also flags like changes to the unit's characteristics, such as remodels, 
and it also includes other sort of measures, including contract rents and what we're going to use, which is economic rents. And so in addition to other differences between CPI tenant rent and these alternative rent measures, the BLS goes through a lot of effort to create measures of rent and prices in general that are sort of stagnant in terms of quality. So for example, they will make adjustments to the rent for changes in what utilities are covered in rent, et cetera, which is something that's, again, very unique to how the CPI tenant rent is designed. Okay, so we are gonna create quarterly indices, largely due to the fact that we are limited in the sample size in the BLS housing survey. So this plot is just showing you our sample size by quarter over time, divided into continuing tenants, so tenants that were there previously in the last observation, and new tenants, so tenants that just recently moved in. And then the red line is showing you the share of all observations that are new tenants. And so it's sort of a comforting fact about this data is that that new tenant share is relatively stable. Yes, it declined somewhat during the Great Recession, but it has since remained fairly flat. But one tricky part about creating any repeat transaction index is that we need not just single observations, but two observations on the same property. And so what I'm showing you here is what happens when we limit our observations to new tenants for which we have more than one observation for which we have a set of two observations on that same unit. So two observations for which a new tenant moved in on that one specific unit. So unfortunately, we don't have much in terms of observations pre-2000. Um, we actually start our index in 2005 so that we get something stable. And then you can see that our observations are declining over time starting in about 2012. At that point, the BLS implemented a new sampling procedure for the BLS housing survey. Um, and also started limiting the length of time that housing units remain in the sample. And so what happens is that limits the number of repeat observations we see for new tenants in the sample. And as a consequence, we also have this change in the share of apartment units that are appear in the sample because tenants in single family rental units tend to stay longer than those in apartment units. We have this sort of shift towards apartment units. Okay, so our results are fairly simple. So what I'm showing you here is just our, the different indices that we create using this underlying sample. So for comparison, I'm plotting CPI tenant rent in purple, and you can see that over time. And what you can see in blue is our all tenant repeat rent index. So this is using the same data almost. We do, it does change this sample slightly when we convert to this new methodology, but it's largely the same sample. Um, and a new methodology. And you can see that they do differ slightly, especially early on in our sample, but they're largely similar, especially when you compare to the differences between CPI rent and the new tenant repeat rent index. The new tenant repeat rent index is where we're limiting our sample to new tenants such as recently moved into a unit. And as I said, what we find in this paper is that the majority of the difference between CPI tenant rent and these alternative rent indices available is the this limitation to new tenants. So what I'm showing you in this graph is I'm comparing against CPI tenant rent and a variety of alternative rent inflation measures and our new tenant repeat rent index. As you remember, our all tenant, when we limited, when we just changed the methodology to all tenant to all tenants, but a repeat rent um, index, we found something very similar to CPI rent in purple. But when we limit to new tenants, we get something that's much closer to these alternative measures that shows much higher inflation um, over the course of 2021 and 2022 than we do in C the official CPI tenant rent. And then lastly, what we wanna do is look at how much um, CPI tenant rent is lagging this, um, our new tenant repeat rent index and other measures. So what we're doing here is we're, we're plotting correlations of the each index relative to a relative to our new tenant repeat rent index. So on the x-axis, you have lags relative to new tenant repeat rent. So the zero, line is showing you the concurrent correlation between a given index. So take the red line, which is the CoreLogic single family rent index, relative to the concurrent 
single family current core logic inflation measure relative to the inflation measure based on our new tenant BP rent index. And you can see for that red line that the peak correlation is at zero. So effectively, CoreLogic SFRI and our new tenant repeat rent index are very similar in terms of the timeliness of the inflation dynamics. However, what you can see is that when you compare to CPI tenant rent in purple, the peak correlation doesn't happen until the lag relative to new tenant repeat rents is four quarters after the new tenant repeat rent index. And so what that means is that CPI tenant rent is lagging our new tenant repeat rent index by about a year. And so we've seen, for example, that currently new tenant rent measures are, show, are starting to decline, but the peak has only happened in the last few quarters. And so we do not expect CPI tenant rent to peak for not, until a year after the peak of those new tenant rent inflation measures. So this paper is really very simple. It's really sort of, I think a lot of people sort of intuited that this was what was driving the difference between these sort of publicly available alternative rent inflation measures and CPI tenant rent. And what we're doing in this paper is confirming officially that that is the case. So we developed these repeat rent indices using the microdata that underlies CPI tenant rent to create two new repeat rent indices, one for all tenants and one for new tenants. And we showed that the majority of the difference that between CPI tenant rent and these alternative measures can be explained by these differences in the scope of the data underlying the indices by limiting the data to new tenant, new tenants relative to all tenants. We also show that new tenant rent growth is going to lead CPI tenant rent by about four quarters. And that's important. And I have not gone into this in much detail here, but we and we do go into this in slightly more detail in the paper, but this has implications for how CPI should be measured and, and for monetary policy. So for a variety of reasons, you, a new tenant repeat rent index is not necessarily appropriate for something like the CPI because the CPI is a cost of living index. It's meant to approximate the changes in the cost of living for a, a sort of constant quality basket of goods. And most people do not move every month or quarter. And so it doesn't necessarily make sense to look at new tenant rents when calculating CPI. However, because of this sort of lead lag relationship between new tenant rent inflation and official CPI rent, it is very possible that um, looking into more detail into new tenant rent inflation may prove useful for monetary policy. So thank you, and that concludes my presentation for today. Thank you, Laura, uh, very much. Before we move to our next speaker, um, I just wanted to remind people that uh, we will have a Q&A session um, after Christopher presents. And, but in the meantime, I wanted to suggest or encourage that if you already have questions that you for Laura, please go ahead and enter them into the Q&A um, now. And as I said, when we, we get to the Q&A session, we'll already have some of them already lined up. So uh, again, Laura, thanks very much. And especially thanks for fitting in nicely with the 15 minutes. It makes my job a little bit easier. So I appreciate that. And now uh, we'll turn to our second speaker. We're very happy that Christopher Weishardt will be here. I'm um, speaking about heterogeneity and inflation indices. So Christopher, welcome, and um, it's all yours. Well, uh, thank you, Rob. And uh, also thanks to both uh, Sipra and in particular Dominic and Rafael for organizing this very exciting webinar series. I'm uh, super happy to have been invited to present this project, which is joint work with uh, Philip Hochmuth and Marcus Pedersen. And uh, as Rob already alluded to, the main question that we ask in this project is whether well, changes in the cost of living depend on income. And we think that in and of itself, this question is super important to answer. And we also think that it has implications for a wide range of economic matters, not least for monetary policy and debates on real income and wealth inequality. And there are also a couple of reasons why we think that the answer to this question is positive. In particular, one of the oldest empirical economic findings is that consumption patterns differ systematically between poorer and richer households. 
And given that households spend their money differently, there's really a large possibility that different households are exposed differently to different price changes. Or put another way, there's a possibility that there's inequality in household level inflation rates. Yet if we consult conventional measures of inflation, these measures won't tell us much about this underlying inequality. If we, for example, use statistical price indices to measure inflation, these indices will only yield one index number. There's one number for inflation that tells us something about how the price of a representative basket changes over time. But in studying this representative basket for a group of households, one effectively ignore any, ignores any heterogeneity within the group. Alternatively, if one considers economic price indices, that is those type of indices that um, are derived from a specification of consumer preferences, the typical assumption made here is that prefer preferences are homothetic. But this assumption implies that everyone makes the same expenditure allocations, and this immediately breaks with the observations made by Engel. So to sort of get at the question that we ask in this paper, we need to go beyond the uh, conventional methods used for measuring inflation. And one possible solution that has often been considered is to stick to the conventional methods for measuring inflation, but dividing households into separate groups based on some characteristics, say for example, income, and then compute inflation measures for each group. And while one may think that this can give an approximate answer to the above question, what we also stress in the paper is that there are some drawbacks to this as approach as well. And in particular, what we show is that one does not really get rid of income effects and that leads the findings resulting from this approach to be biased. And we show that this bias, at least for the empirical exercise that we conduct, is quite sizable. But even if this bias was neglectable, one still, by using this group-specific approach, ignores heterogeneity within groups and only sort of pick points on the uh, distribution of inflation. So to sort of overcome these potential uh, shortfalls of existing methods, what we contribute with is first of all, a theoretical derivation of a non-homothetic cost of living index. And at the heart of this index lies the distinguishment between consumption of necessity goods and consumption of luxury goods. And what we show is that the index we derive is a, generaliz a generalization of all known superlative indices. This is a class of indices that within index theory is sort of viewed as the gold standard of indices. So departing from that um, class of indices really uh, comforts us in that we are uh, departing from the right place. What we then also demonstrate is that the framework we provide is suitable for both studying the entire distribution of inflation, but also for studying what we call market inflation, that is something akin to this notion of an aggregate level of inflation that so often takes center stage, both in public debates, but which is also um, the measure that is used to, for example, steer uh, monetary policy. We then also demonstrate that estimating this index is feasible, in particular under the assumption of weak severability between necessities and luxuries, one, can, one only has to have to estimate two parameters, and that is in stark contrast with, um, for example, demand system estimation, where it is known that the number of parameters one needs to estimate is exploding in the number of products that one considers, but we can keep this number of parameters down to two regardless of the number of products one considers. Now in a second part of the paper after having derived this cost of living index, we study inflation inequality in the US from 1995 using a matched CEX CPI data set. And what we find is that the average inflation rate since 1995 has been very similar across the uh, expenditure distribution. This is in contrast to what one would find if one uses um, the group specific approach, 
But what we also show is that despite this similarity in average inflation rates, there's much more hiding behind this result. And in particular, we find that while richer households have experienced a fairly stable rate of inflation around this 2.2%, poorer households experience a much more volatile inflation. And in some periods, there are great differences between the inflation rates of households. And that is particularly true if we zoom in um, on what has been going on recently. So in this figure, I show you the recent inflation developments for uh, different decile groups, so different points on this um, inflation distribution. And what you see is that in October, the most recent month, which we have numbers from, the inflation difference between the richest and the poorest is more than two percentage points. And if we go back to June, where inflation spiked for everyone, the difference amounts to 4.5 percentage points. So there are indeed periods in time where inflation differs a lot between households. Now, before I um, spend the remaining uh, minutes of this presentation on sort of telling you about the mechanisms and the methodology behind these results, let me also just um, conclude the review of our empirical findings uh, by looking at the drivers behind these results. So in this figure, I show you a decomposition of inflation for respectively the poor, poorest and richest households. And what you see in this figure is that the poorest households inflation has been driven up primarily by increases in prices of food at home, gas and utilities. And while richer households have also been hit by the increase in these categories, they spend a much larger, less, a much smaller share uh, of total uh, expenditures in these categories, and hence they are less exposed to these price increases. Instead, they have a much more dispersed exposure to price increases from different goods. All right. Um, I'll now dive a bit into our theoretical uh, contribution, the underlying mechanism of our non homothetic cost of living index. And, I'll then conclude by also uh, showing you how you can actually estimate the index and take it to the data for use. So um, our cost of living index is an economic index. It departs from the so-called price independent generalized linearity preferences. These preferences are given by the indirect utility function, which in its most general form depends on total expenditures E, two price functions B and A and the parameter epsilon. And in the specific parameterization that we consider in the paper, we um, introduce two new parameters, nu and gamma, and another price function called D. And this is a specification of PIDL preferences that has been used in the structural change literature. And I'll also try to convince you that it makes perfect sense in our setup. And I'll do so by sort of giving you an idea about which uh, the interpretation of each term here. So um, first of all, the two price functions, D and B, have very specific interpretations. The D function is representing a cost function of some subutility D, which bundles together all the prices of necessity goods. And the B function, is a cost function of subutility B, which bundles together all the prices spent on luxury goods. And this is evident from the derived expenditure share equations, where you can see that the expenditure share on D goods is declining in total expenditures, that is the very definition of necessity goods, and the expenditure share on B goods is increasing in total expenditures, that is the definition of luxury goods. From this expenditure share equation, you can also realize that epsilon governs the degree of non-homophoticity. And in particular, epsilon tells you how much in percent the 
the expenditure share on necessities declines as expenditures increases by 1%. You have substitution between luxury and necessity goods, and new is just a scale parameter controlling the level of demand for necessity goods. Now, with these PIDL uh, preferences, we are able to arrive at or arrive at our main theoretical contribution, which is the PIGL cost of living index. We show that this index is a weighted geometric mean over prices on necessities and luxuries, respectively. And this is a form that is similar to that of conventional measures. The difference, however, is that the weights here depend on utility prices and preference parameters. And in particular, this phi function here is a household specific weight that depends on expenditures. That also implies that the PIGL cost of living index is specific to each household. And it also implies that we have inflation rate differences if households have different expenditure levels and if these preference parameters support non homophoticities Now, the last, this is our uh, contribution in a nutshell in the uh, paper. We also have some uh, extensions where we introduce a third type of consumption bundle, namely a consumption bundle that has a hump shaped um, angle curve. We introduce taste shocks and we also um, provide the proof for this generalization of superlative indices. But uh, for now, let me just give you an idea about how you can also take this cost of living index to the data and arrive at the results I presented uh, a couple of minutes ago. The PIGL cost of living index requires only a few things. First of all, it requires that we classify goods into necessities or luxuries. This class classification can come from just studying the slope of angle curves. Downward sloping angle curves gives a necessity good, upward sloping angle curves gives a luxury good. Then in order to compute the index, we also need estimates of epsilon and gamma, and one can estimate these two parameters directly from um, the expenditure share equations I already showed you. And in particular, what one can observe is that the expenditure share on necessity goods, WD here, and the total level of expenditures is directly observable in the data. And given that goods are either necessities or luxuries, that is, goods are weakly separable between these two types of classification, then the two price functions, D and B, can be computed from observed within expenditure shares. That is, for example, the expenditure share on food at home out of total necessity spendings. And put another way, we can compute D and B directly from observed data. There's no need for estimation here. And with this in place, one can either estimate epsilon and gamma using microdata, which we do using a couple CX CPI data set in this paper. Or one can also, if one doesn't have microdata, estimate parameters using macro data, which is something that we are exploring in a follow-up paper using the PCE data set. Having estimated epsilon and gamma, the only thing one then needs is to plug in some expenditure levels in order to um, also compute this phi function. And then we arrive at the PIDL cost of living index. I think that also, allows me to stop 10 seconds before time if my timer is correct and give the word back to you, uh, Rob. Thanks, Christopher, very much. Um, first of all, let me, let me begin by saying thank you very much to both, uh, to both Laura and Christopher for, for excellent presentations. I'm going to do my best to hopefully once again um, Hopefully, bring up. Can everyone see the? Oh, sorry. There we go. There we go. Hopefully, we see the thank you and questions. Um, so uh, we do have um, an opportunity now for some for for questions. 
Um, and again, I'd ask people to put them into the, the q and We are, actually have one already in the Q&A. So let me go ahead and read this. Um, and I think this, this first one is for Christopher. And the question is, do you know if there are different patterns of substitution in baskets of goods across wealth cohorts? I'm asking because much as the goods themselves are different, the availability of substitutes may also differ across wealth cohorts, or is this built into the definition of quote necessity and luxury? Oh, Christopher, so, I think yeah, you might. Yeah, I'm just, uh, I'm just reading the, the question uh, again. So um, actually it, it's not something that we have uh, thought so much about. I think uh, wealth cohorts must refer to, I guess, different income groups or, uh, no, I'm, I'm not quite sure what the question is actually uh, asking for, uh, much of the goods themselves are different. Uh, okay, so maybe maybe what I'll do is I'll I'll ask the the person to maybe if they want to maybe clarify it and then I'll I'll turn um, with another question I think which is one that was directed towards um, Laura. So um, I, I think that one one of the questions and I think this one comes from something that you hinted at Laura before, which is um, that the forecasting angle is quite interesting. Is there indeed forecasting power in the lead relationship? And I assume what this is getting at is the idea that even though we want to use, you know, in the CPI sort of regular measures, right? There, there's an indication right now that that we're going to be anticipating movements in inflation going forward, um, and that would be, you know, relevant for monetary policymakers. So, do you want to comment at all about how one might, or if there's an ability to incorporate? the lead lag relationship um, for forecasting. Yeah, um, so I have two comments related to that. So the first is that these are not unrelated series in the sense that if you're looking at the new tenant rent index and comparing that to CPI rent, I mean, they're not, this, the new tenants are, co are component of CPI rent. So they're going to just be related because they are, in, in, there's going to be a relationship between the two because they are not, sort of completely dissimilar series. So it's, I don't think it's appropriate to think about the forecasting relationship like you would with two sort of completely separate series that you're looking at in terms of like the macroeconomy. In fact, one way of thinking about it is to think about CPI rent or an all tenant rent index as a moving average of the new tenant rent index because the new tenants are the inflows into the all tenant rent index. And so if you have an and so you could even think of it as like, if there's a constant share of new tenants, which is not a poor approximation given what we see in the data, um, then you have a shift up in the rent in the rent inflation rate for new tenants. What you're gonna see is that the all tenant rent is gonna sort of slowly move up to meet that as, as all those existing tenants are replaced by new tenants in that all tenant repeat rent index. And so, Yes, there will be a forecast, an actual forecasting power in that lead like relationship that we don't have like sort of the ability to do something where we're doing some sort of out of sample thing necessarily because we frankly just don't have the history of this sort of new tenant data available to us. Um, the new alternative measures that are out there are really like have only been around since the sort of housing boom and maybe it's surprising, but like rents just weren't moving around that much during the 2000s housing boom. Um, it's only recently that we've really seen this sort of dynamics where we've seen this sort of divergence between new tenant rents and um, all tenant rent inflation. And so, yes, they will be <laughs> directly related because they are, this one is an input to the other. Um, and two, like, it's, go, it's going to be hard to say exactly. I think we're going to only learn over time exactly what the exact forecasting relationship is going to be. Okay, thanks. Um, Christopher, do you, I think you had your hand up. So do you have a question that you wanted to ask? Because I actually have one for you also, but why don't you go ahead and ask uh, your question? I'm, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to answer your question as well, but I also think uh, Naomi deserves perhaps a little bit of elaboration now that I actually read the question. Um, Okay, so uh, I think uh, what Naomi asks about, and, and she's, you're more than welcome, Naomi, to reach out afterwards if I'm getting you wrong here, but what she's asking for as well, there are 
uh, differences in the ability to uh, availability to substitute between goods. And it's something that at least in our empirical exercise, we do not um, distinguish between. So we actually can uh, assume that everyone has the same possibilities to go, go out and buy necessities um, versus luxury goods. But I also know that there's a large literature, uh, Jesse Hanbury for one has an econometrical paper, which is very interesting and, and much more directed towards this answer, but it's not something that we directly um, answer in our uh, work. So that's just a sort of clarification on that. Okay, great, thanks. And, and thanks for, for clarifying that. Um, so I actually have a question for you, Christopher, and maybe um, hopefully this won't show too much of my ignorance, but I'm, I'm familiar with some work that um, Xavier um, Haravel has done also, I think on inflation inequality. And if I remember what his results were, he typically found, I think he was looking at a similar sample period, although I'm not sure. And I think he looked at quintiles of income. And I think he noted that there typically was something like maybe a one to one and a half percentage point differential sort of between the low income and the high income groups. So you also have a differential, but yours seems to be more concentrated kind of during the pandemic, whereas I think his tended to be sort of more over a longer sample period. So um, I know we're running out of time and this is a long question, but I guess I was just curious to know if there, if, if you've thought about sort of how your results are differing from his, because I, I know that he's he's received a considerable amount of attention. So just anything that you might be able to add as an insight would be, I think, very helpful, thanks. Yes, um, yeah, just uh, briefly, um, the sort of the, the time period that uh, Jaravel considers is from 2004 to 2015. That is a time period that we also have within our uh, entire period. We start from 1995 and call all the way. And if we just zoom in on the period from four until 15, then we arrive at sort of the same conclusions uh, in terms of inflation, average inflation inequality between richest and poorest households. But what we also stress is that there is, um, in Jaravel's approach, um, a, the approach does not really allow one to get rid of income effects. And hence, the results may uh, just be a spurious correlation between um, income and observed expenditures, shares, which does not really uh, give you the change in cost of living, but um, just tells you something about how um, income effects are also affecting uh, these uh, quintile specific uh, measures of inflation. On the, on the positive side, though, um, we find that the inflation inequality difference is in this period around 0.4 percentage points, fairly close to what Jaravel finds. So that's sort of on the positive note, um, but it's derived from two completely different uh, methods. Okay, great. Um, I see that we're getting close to, I think, the, the cutoff time. So let me um, just uh, two things. First, uh, I want to take the opportunity to thank again our presenters, both Laura and Christopher. Um, it was terrific presentations. Really enjoyed it a great deal. I also wanted to remind people in our audience um, that the next presentation is going to be on December 13th, and that'll be on understanding inflation dynamics. So again, um, thanks very much to our speakers and to our audience, and again, to Raphael and Dominic for organizing this. And um, Raphael, I don't know if you have any closing remarks that you'd like to, to bring it on home with. Um, no, I'd just like to thank you for these excellent presentations. I think really on very urgent questions. Um, and uh, thank you for moderating, Rob. Um, and thank you for listening. All right, great. So again, thanks to everyone and um, we'll see you on December 13th then. Thank you.